Hello and welcome to this very special service of Thanksgiving for Morris. My name is Anne Hibbert and I'm the founder and director of ministry at the Well Christian Healing Centre here in Royal Leamington Spa. All of us prayed and hoped that Morris would be restored to full health. But it is with sadness that we meet this morning, but actually in the knowledge that Morris now is more alive than he ever was here on this earth. Jesus once said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He that follows me, even though he dies, will live forever. This is an incredible truth. We're now going to sing together a beautiful song about Jesus being our good shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd, I will not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by. Your goodness and mercy will lead me home. And that's what we believe for Morris, that he is now with his Lord and Saviour. I'm going to ask in a moment a number of his friends to share some of their memories of Morris. I would truly describe Morris as a mighty man of God who has left a huge legacy behind him. But first, 
let me just give you a little bit of background. You see, I had a really fabulous conversation earlier this week with Helen. We were on the phone for about an hour and a half and she was talking about Morris's life. So here are just a few headlines of it, just in case you didn't know these facts. Morris was born on the 13th of November, 1944, in a Cambridgeshire village called Haddenham. He has a sister called Margaret. His mum was a trained nurse and his dad was a grocer. And then at some stage, his dad went into business with his father-in-law and they moved to Great Shelford in Cambridgeshire and they ran together a hardware shop. Morris's parents belonged to a local Baptist church. And Helen tells me at the age of 14, Morris had a very significant encounter with Jesus Christ. He went to an evangelistic service. He heard about what Jesus had really done for him. And he decided on that occasion that he wanted to give his whole life to Jesus Christ. He wanted to be a disciple. Helen shares that a local Christian from that church really took Morris under his wing and spent many, many days and weeks and months encouraging Morris, discipling him. And it was from that occasion or occasions that Morris learned that it was really good to read his Bible every day and to pray. And that became a lifelong pattern which he passed on to so many other people. At the end of his school, school years, he then went off to uh, Cambridge University and he went to uh, St. Catherine's College to study classics. Now, I didn't know that. And he did that for two years. During that time, he belonged to the local Christian union within that college. And he decided at the start of his third year, he was going to switch from classics to theology because he felt that God was calling him into full-time ministry. After university, he did a little bit of teaching. And then in 1968, he moved to Spurgeon's College, which is a Baptist training college. He spent four years there. And whilst he was there, he did a student pastorate in America. And Helen tells me that she felt that God allowed him to have that experience because little did Morris know, but God was preparing him to have an American wife. In 1972, Morris went to Meredith Baptist Church in Coventry, and there he preached with a view. They unanimously decided that he was going to be their pastor and he remained there until he retired in 2008. So he's actually their pastor for 37 years. And I had the pleasure of going to his uh, retirement service. Did Morris ever retire? Not sure. Anyway, I went to Queen's Baptist Church for his retirement service and it was absolutely packed. And it was fascinating hearing testimony after testimony of how Morris had really helped different individuals in their lives. Okay, back to Morris's story. So he's a pastor at Meredith Road Baptist Church. And in 1978, in wanders Helen, this young American woman. And uh, she was working in the local Christian bookshop in Coventry. And she just happened to live quite close to this local church. So she wandered in one morning to a family service. She didn't know anyone. And there was quite a group of people at the front of the service. And she spied Morris, not knowing who he was. And she said, these are his words, wait for it. As soon as I spied Morris, my heart flipped. I knew that he was God's choice for me. She carries on to share that uh, she had a, a wonderful landlady who loved hospitality. And soon Morris was invited round for Sunday lunch. Well, that was a start of how uh, Helen describes a very slow, cautious, long, uh, romantic kind of relationship with Morris. 
After two years, on the 15th of December, 1980, uh, Morris actually proposed to her uh, while she was down in London working for OM. She was completely surprised. And so in 1980, on Christmas day, uh, Morris announced to the whole of the church that he was engaged and apparently they were shocked, but wonderfully surprised. And then on the 28th of March, the following year, 1981, people gathered at Meredith Road Baptist Church and Paul, a very special a friend of theirs with a registrar present, Paul married them. And I'm now gonna hand over to Paul for one or two of his reflections. Um, my name's Paul Bowes, and uh, this is my wife, Angela, next to me. We first met Morris when we joined Meredith Road Baptist Church in the early 70s. I was one of Morris's elders eventually and quickly um, became, had a lasting friendship. We really developed then. Angela and I, as Anna's mentioned, instrumental in bringing Morris and Helen together. We actually first met Helen when she turned up at church on that Sunday morning and we chatted to her. Shortly afterwards, we met her again in the Christian bookshop in town where she was the manager. And actually stepping outside the shop on that particular day, we both felt that God said that this was the lady for Morris to marry. And it was an amazingly clear revelation from God. Later on, Helen um, continued to come to church. We got to know her quite well and uh, befriended her and Helen babysat for our daughter Anna quite often. One day, I think when I was driving her back home, Helen confided in me that when she first stepped into Meredith Road, as Anna's already said, she saw Morris and she knew that this was her future husband. Surprise, surprise. <clears throat> so, God knew, Helen knew, we knew, that Morris needed some convincing. We took them on a date for a meal together, but sadly Morris didn't quite get it. <clears throat> now the Lord works in mysterious ways, cutting a very long story short, so much, much later Morris invited me to officiate at their wedding. Wow, never done that before. <clears throat> Now, Anna, my four-year-old, she became the flower girl um, in American tradition and walked ahead of the bride. And she did great. Not so her father, who managed to turn over two pages during the vows exchange. I remember it well. Morris's face and eyes said it all. <clears throat> We were with Morris when the decision was made to start a weekly meeting to seek God for healing ministry quite a long while ago, which, as you know, became gifted in over the years. I remember attending meetings arranged by the Reverend Graham Dow at um, uh, Holy Trinity in, in town with him, where we learned a lot. We had the joy and experience of going with them to India to minister prayer and healing. Um, to the pastors and the folks in Kerala uh, on two occasions. On a more personal level, Helen and Morris became very close to us and we shared our joys and our hurts together, prayed for each other, and incidentally had Christmas dinner on numerous occasions with our then three children, followed by a sleep in the afternoon after the Queen, of course, and then played Uno until the early hours. We had um, a glass top table then, which Morris found quite useful when lying on the floor, he could see the cards placed face down of his opponents. Very competitive man. Morris was kind, thoughtful, a great Bible teacher, compassionate and loving, always fair, and was a great pastor 
and a close friend. We shall miss him greatly, but the Lord has called him home as his work here indeed is finished. I to say thank you to Helen for her friendship, which is ongoing. Thank you, Jesus, for sharing Morris with us. Thank you, Paul. I'm now going to invite Darren and Steve, fellow Baptist ministers to uh, Morris, to share one or two reflections. Darren. Well, thank you, Anne. It's lovely to be with you all here this morning. I am the pastor at Limbrick Wood Baptist Church. And as I was thinking about what to say this morning in tribute to, to Morris, I suppose we can all ask ourselves that question. How did Morris step into our lives? Where did he come from? Because suddenly Morris is there and he's just instrumental and part of our lives. And, and he impacted me in such an amazing way. I suppose the first time I met Morris was actually via the well. And he was praying for me in a prayer ministry session. And the impact that I had on my life had a massive impact on the church at Limbrick Wood Baptist Church as well. And of course, as, as a result of a church being impacted, that then impacts a community. Uh, and so that that keeps going on. The, the reach that Morris has on an individual, as I'm sure you all have experienced, it just pours out of us. And Morris's words just sit there within each and every one of us. And I think that word that Anne you used a minute ago, that legacy, I mean, we, we will all have part of that legacy in us. Morris's words, whenever I'm praying, I'm sure you can hear those words too of Morris speaking and, and just that calmness and that peace and that love and just God's presence that he brought was something super special. And, and as I was thinking um, and we were praying for Morris, um, I realised uh, the last time I actually met with Morris, it was at the church and he left his coat behind and he sent me an email saying, Darren, I've left my coat. And as I was praying for Morris, I thought, you know what? There's something about leaving coats behind. And, and that Elisha call that I think all of us have got there, I'm sure that comes to your mind, that there's a call, isn't there, to come and, and, and pick up that, that Elijah coat ourselves and to take that and receive that call. And Morris's coat is still hanging in my office and I fully expected him to come back and get it. But it's there and I, I suppose just that, that thought for each and every one of us here as, as we're remembering Morris is, look, he's passed something special onto each and every one of us. And we've got to treasure that. But I suppose just with those words that Jesus said is go, go and do likewise. And as much as Morris, and I'm sure a lot of you would have experienced Morris, he, he's, he, he's interested in what we're doing, but he was interested in his, us as individuals. And I know one thing Morris always said to me was, Darren, how are you? Are you getting enough sleep? How are you? And he was interested in us. And out of that place of peace and rest and comfort and strength, I think we've got to pick up that legacy. We've got to pick up those coats and we've got to go and do likewise. Morris, we love you. Helen, we absolutely love you too. Bless you for being part of our lives and the impact that you've had. We are going to continue that legacy. We're going to pick up those coats. We're going to put them on and we're going to go in that power and that strength and that authority of Jesus' name, which Morris knew so well. God bless you. Thank you, Darren. I think it was back in 2018, Morris introduced me to Steve from Lawrence Saunders Road Baptist Church, and we were able to do a well uh, healing training course there. Steve, would you like to share one or two reflections with us? Yes, thank, thank you, Anne. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Steve, myself, and my wife, Sandra. Um, I, I first met uh, Morris in 2011 when he was the moderator of Lawrence Saunders Road Baptist Church and uh, I was uh, in the process of being appointed as the minister there and uh, I think I was a little bit nervous of Morris first of all. Um, he was quite forthright uh, but I soon became, uh, soon came to appreciate his wisdom and his encouragement but also his, his grace and his immense love of Jesus came through. And uh, he was the right person to have at your side as the church is making the decision about you. And Sandra and I kept in touch with Morris and Helen, and we shared uh, a love of uh, national trust houses and 
also, of course, with cream teas together. And, and amongst Morris and Helen's many friendships and, and their very busy ministry, they found time to be friends with Sandra and myself. And Morris was a staunch supporter uh, and friend in my ministry too. When he knew the ups and downs, he, he'd, he'd been through the struggles. I mean, over 37 years, he had truly been there and got the t-shirt. And he was immensely encouraging and helpful. So when difficulties came uh, in, in the course of my ministry, as they do to every church leader, uh, Morris was there at my side, offering wise counsel and, and encouragement. And he and Helen prayed for us. They prayed with us. Uh, and, uh, you know, when God asks, when you ask God for help, he often sends someone to stand by your side. For me, he sent Morris, a wise, old, battle-scarred prayer warrior. And as a double blessing, he sent Helen too. And uh, as you mentioned, Anne, Morris and, and Helen introduced us to the work of the well and to the work of prayer ministry. And that is still impacting uh, our church today, not just the folks in the church, but the community as well. I think if, uh, if I'm honest, uh, there, uh, we sometimes question God's timing, don't we? Why should God take Morris now when there's so much work still to do, so much energy and passion and gifting fired up, ready for the work of the kingdom? Well, I think that's a question we need to sit with. I think there is something in what Darren has said about us picking up the mantle and carrying on the work. But I think this weekend for me, as I like perhaps like as first disciples sat, uh, isolated, somewhat confused and sad. It, for me, it was a time to lament the passing of a great friend and a wonderful encourager. But Morris, I think, would have been the first to say, ah, oh, but Easter is coming. Easter Day is here. And, and, and Easter Day, when uh, all the disease and death and darkness of the devil was destroyed as Jesus walked out of the tomb. That's the hope that Morris had. And that's the hope that he shared with everyone. And that's the thing I perhaps remember most about him, his hope in all that God could do through the resurrection of Jesus. So thank you, Morris, for what you taught me, for your prayerful wisdom, for your presence, for being Jesus to me when I most needed it. Thank you for being yourself. And uh, Helen, our hearts go out to you. That on behalf of the church, from my, from, my, from my heart, I want to say there will always be a place for you at Lawrence Simons Road. Baptist Church and I hope that the resurrected Jesus will lead you through these dark days to the light and life of our Easter hope a hope that even now Morris uh, is already experiencing and would want all of us to share the good news of the resurrected Jesus amen amen thank you Steve lots of memories lots of reflections we're now going to pause and listen to a very beautiful musical piece by Ruth Fazell. Ruth has visited the well a number of times now and she was with us uh, back in November. And every time Morris and Helen came to her concerts and her events. So let's pause and listen to this piece called Cry. And we're going to put a photograph on the screen and it was actually taken by a friend of mine who was visiting Iona. It's a beautiful picture. Let that and the music speak to you as we individually reflect on our friendship with Morris.
We're now going to hear some more people's reflection. And I'm going to invite Marinella, who now is a member of the Well Christian Healing Centre's prayer team, to speak, but particularly on her involvement with Morris in CPM, and Morris was the chairman of it. Marinella. Thank you. Good morning. I've often heard Morris quote John 8, verse 32. And I'm just going to read the Passion translation of this. And the first part of that verse says, when you continue to embrace all that I teach you, you prove that you are my true followers. And this piece of scripture for me sums up Morris because he embraced wholeheartedly all that Jesus taught him. Morris set the example. He was a true follower of Jesus Christ. And the second part of that verse goes on to say, if you embrace the truth, it will release more freedom into your lives. As part of Christian prayer ministries, this is what Morris accomplished. Through the power of Jesus, he did set people free from sin and bondage and brought healing into their lives. Morris had many fruitful years with Christian prayer ministries going right back to 1988, when he was joined by Lewis Stevenson in taking their very first prayer healing appointment with a guest. And this was to be the first of many prayer healing appointments that Morris was to be involved in. And I'm sure many can testify, as I can, that if you were partnered with Morris, you knew you were in safe hands, definitely. Morris brought great wisdom and leadership to CPM and a very deep understanding and knowledge of the healing ministry. And he had great insight into the outworking of the Holy Spirit, which he shared with such enthusiasm. Morris took a primary role in the training of prayer ministers. You see, he realized the great importance that healing has in enabling people to move into a deeper relationship with God. Oh, and didn't God give Morris an amazing gift of teaching? Those of us on the teams and those who received prayer appointments have hugely benefited from his teachings. Through Morris, we have grown in our understanding and knowledge of Jesus's healing power. In 2014, Morris became the chairperson of Christian Prayer Ministries and prayerfully guided us through various issues and decisions we faced as a Christian national organisation. Morris had a passion, not just for Jesus, but for people to see people being healed and set free. And, uh, and I stand here as, as a, a witness to that because that's what he did for me both him and Helen, working in partnership. And I think we all will agree that Morris's passing leaves a huge gap, which will be hard to fill. But we take comfort in the knowledge that Morris, who was God's good and faithful servant, has definitely gone home to glory. And I'm just going to pray. Lord, we give thanks and praise for Morris. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you enabled him to fulfill during his lifetime. We thank you that our lives have been blessed and made richer as a result of knowing him. And we thank you that you will continue to honour all that Morris has accomplished on earth. And we absolutely acknowledge that Morris is now even more alive in you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Over the last few years, at the beginning of the year, perhaps we have received a prayer letter from Morris and Helen because they were going off to India. And it sounds like uh, extraordinary things happened whilst they were there. And I'm going to invite Les now to share about Heartlink. Hello. My name is Les Wade. And uh, 
I've known Morris for 40 years, but in fact, I actually met Helen first. She had just come back from uh, over from America after completing theological training with a vision to go and work in India. But God had other plans for the initial period of her life and uh, led her in ways that we've uh, recently heard. Having known Morris for 40 years and being associate minister with him at Meredith Road Baptist Church for three of those years, um, we got to know each other very well. Um, I loved him greatly, and uh, so did my wife, my first wife, Dot, who died of cancer, and uh, my second wife here, Mary, who prayed for us for 30 years in our work in Albania and India and other places. Well, Morris and Helen eventually <coughs> felt led to go to India more regularly. And uh, they approached me to see if uh, we could work together. And so we went together a number of years running until my wife had uh, Alzheimer's and uh, recently had a stroke. And they've continued that work in India uh, from when I couldn't go. A lovely thing happened to me in 1984. I was in an OM conference, having been in OM as a leader for 30 years. Um, and uh, I was in a business meeting and my mind was somewhere else. And this picture of the Himalayan mountains came into my mind and heart. And the rivers flowing down into the Ganges Valley and there were no words, but it was as though the Lord was impressing on me. This is what I'm gonna do by my spirit. I'm going to bring life to the whole of the Ganges Valley. And ever since then, um, from that date onwards, 1984, hundreds of thousands of people have come to Christ in the most difficult area of India, from the Punjab in the west, right across to West Bengal in the east. Morris and Helen have significantly um, been involved in the development of that work. Um, teaching pastors, teachers, evangelists, and church planters. This is now the greatest need right across India, especially across the Ganges Valley of North India. His many teaching sessions have now been published and printed in two books, in Oriya, the language of Orissa, which was probably one of the most unreached and poverty-stricken states in India, in the Northeast, uh, and into Hindi, which was the majority language of uh, India, particularly the North, and Tamil also. Uh, these can now reach and equip the majority of, of India's 1.3 billion people who will respond to, to the Lord. Let's pray. The Lord's word will spread and multiply by his Holy Spirit, and that many thousands more will be saved. What a legacy. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen to that. Many of you know my story uh, about the well when God gave me the vision in June 2002. When I finally said yes to God, I was really clueless. How do you start a healing centre from nothing? And I started to ask amongst my friends, what shall I do? How am I going to do this? I'm not really sure how God heals today. And it was some friends from my church, uh, Lewis and Angela Stevenson, who said, I think you need to phone up uh, Maurice Markham. I did that. And shortly afterwards, I met Maurice at uh, Meredith Road one Tuesday morning, I think it was. And we spent ages talking together. And as a result of that meeting, Morris said, I'll journey with you. We'll help in any way possible. And from that time in 2002, I've been regularly meeting with Morris and Helen to pray. And through the years, I have phoned them up so many times saying, this is happening. What do I do? Oh my goodness. And Morris always, always said, it's okay. God's got this covered. And he just shared from his vast experience in the healing ministry. It really has been an absolute privilege to be coached and mentored by Morris. He leaves a huge hole in my life. He has been always there. 
and I praise God for him. And I certainly have caught that baton, taken that baton. And I promise, Morris, I will faithfully carry that baton and pass it on to others. Last summer, I had a phone call from somebody, uh, Steve actually, uh, up in the north. And he invited me to do some specific teaching uh, in his church and in his area. And when I heard about it, I thought, I think I need to take Morris because I think he is the man for the job. And so we went to visit and Morris then continued to work alongside Steve. Let's hear from you now. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, having heard some of the really moving tributes, uh, it's a great privilege just to be asked to share these uh, couple of thoughts on my own experience with Morris uh, having been very much a latecomer really to uh, his life um, Darren said before uh, we ask ourselves the question where is where did Morris come from uh, suddenly Morris is there in a big part of our life and that was very much the case for me as Anne mentioned there um, about uh, 13 14 months ago now uh, a series of events happened in my own church in Blackpool that uh, made me realize actually there was some really significant underlying spiritual issues uh, connected with historic uh, involvement in Freemasonry that needed resolving in the church before the church could really move forward and flourish. Uh, and then uh, a really kind of wonderful set of uh, God incidences fell into line. Uh, a couple of days later, my bishop rang me and said, uh, last night I had a dream and uh, we really need to do something about this problem, Steve. And so together we went to meet uh, Anne and Morris because really there was nobody uh, that we knew of that had any real expertise or experience of dealing with the kind of thing that we were looking at. And so we went uh, to meet Morris and Anne and really that was the start of what rapidly became quite a significant relationship for me in my life as uh, Morris was able to uh, help, to encourage, to mentor uh, and to uh, for us really to learn together actually because Morris's experience in this area as, uh, as with Anne is in ministering to people uh, that have had maybe kind of generational connections to Freemasonry. So this whole uh, experience of uh, ministry to buildings that had had this generational connection was, I think, new for all of us. Uh, and so uh, this wonderful relationship uh, developed and I began to really appreciate Morris's uh, love, support, encouragement and wisdom. Uh, one of my claims to fame is that I too have been face down on the floor with Morris Markham's foot on my back. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know from uh, a couple of the prayer meetings that we had that uh, that was one of his trademark uh, training techniques. And I think in November last year, Morris came up and led a whole day's training. Actually, we shared it together, which was a wonderful experience for me to be able to teach alongside Morris. And uh, there I was face down, as I say. Uh, but one of the things that really stood out for me on that day was the energy and the passion with which Morris uh, delivered this training. Here was a man in his 70s who uh, was able to show great energy and stamina in uh, going so strongly. And I thought, wow, when I'm that age, Lord, please, that's how I want to be uh, going for you until, uh, you know, there's no breath left in my lungs. When Morris delivered that training, uh, I was uh, very glad to have him stay here for a couple of nights with us. Uh, we uh, found, just as we've been hearing from Les, that we had a shared passion and interest in India. I've been there a number of times myself. And uh, again, this kind of sense of mutual support and friendship developed. And the fruit of that has been really significant. You know, we've had some real significant breakthrough in our own situation here in Blackpool. Uh, and I've been able to 
help other people with Morris's kind of support and encouragement in their own situations as well. And in fact, uh, actually, just the week that the lockdown began, we were supposed to go together to Leeds to help and support a group of churches there. And uh, I think Morris was as surprised as anybody that his stage of life, uh, this brand new area of ministry had kind of opened up. One of the last things that Morris said to me when he was here uh, for that training session last November is this verse from Psalm 119, and it really surprised and humbled me. Uh, he said, Steve, uh, what I can see now is the situation the psalmist talks about is Psalm 119, verse 99. And it says this, I have more insight than all my teachers. He said, I'm passing the baton to you now. I've done my part here. And uh, that was uh, uh, quite daunting, quite overwhelming. Uh, somebody mentioned Morris's forthrightness before. And so it sounds like it was fairly typically Morris, actually, as well. But um, uh, just one thing uh, or a couple of things just to finish that I was thinking of as uh, I was thinking about that psalm. First of all, that's a testimony to the massive amount of wisdom uh that morris was able to impart into my life in really a very short space of time and um, it shows actually what other people have reflected on as well a great desire just to give away and to encourage and to invest in and to mentor other people uh, and how he never gave up doing that. I think that's something I'm really going to learn in my own life from Morris, that actually, until the very, very end, uh, he was giving everything to mentor, to invest in other people. Uh, it showed great humility, because we've all uh, actually probably encountered teachers who would not uh, have the humility to be able to say that to somebody else. Uh, and I think, finally, it showed a real confidence um, it actually, the fact that he knew who he was in Christ, you know, to say something like that to somebody else, I think, takes a great deal of confidence and security in our own identity in Christ, doesn't it? Um, he was a wonderful man. I thank God for uh, just the short but very significant amount of time that I've been able to know Morris. And uh, yes, we, we grieve with uh, uh, Helen and all those who loved and cared for him. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We're now going to pause and we're going to listen to the choir of King's College, Cambridge, accompanied by the New Philharmonia Orchestra and conducted by Sir David Wilcox singing Horus Sanctus. You may all know that King's College was a particular favourite of Morris and Helen and they're always going to listen or tuning in on the television and this beautiful recording of them singing these very special words from the Bible. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest.
so very beautiful. We're now going to have a reading from Psalm 46, and it's a psalm that we have used many, many times as we've prayed for Morris and Helen recently. Luke is going to read it, and like so many of us, he has been blessed by Morris's ministry to him. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Thank you, Luke. I'm now going to invite Bishop Graham to share a few words on this passage. I first met uh, Graham when I was a minister in Leicester. And then when God gave me the vision for the well, uh, he one day just arrived in his bishop's car and he knocked on my door and he sat down and had a cup of tea with me. And it was absolutely wonderful because uh, Graham is very experienced in the healing ministry. And as I was talking to Helen earlier this week, she described Graham as being a big influence in Morris's life. Graham. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, you know now that Morris was a Baptist minister in Coventry when I was the vicar of Holy Trinity Church in the 1980s. Uh, early in my time there, I started teaching Christians across the city to pray for healing. And although at that time I didn't know him really well, uh, Morris signed up for one of the teaching weekends. And I think it's no exaggeration to say that it bowled him over. He brought healing back into his church at Meredith Road. I can remember him describing how he prayed with the child when the child was asleep. The child's father or grandfather had been a Freemason. And as Morris prayed with the parents and set the child free, the sleeping child's hands went up round his neck as if to show the noose that masons hang round their head and that the power of the curse on the child was being broken. I don't remember much more of our contact over those years, but Morris was always very warm and caring, a great pastor teacher in his church and fully behind the Ministry of Healing. In Coventry, we met monthly as Christian leaders for a breakfast and to support in prayer all that God was doing. And Morris joined in and had the humility to learn from others and to pass on what he'd learned. Time spent with Morris was always encouraging. He was a Barnabas, a son of encouragement. So when he retired, it was no surprise that he chose to focus on healing and he became a wonderful support to Anne at the well as we've been hearing. And he had an unswerving commitment to the scriptures, as we've also been hearing. Morris and I exchanged emails from time to time on several occasions, in which he passed on to me what he was learning about setting believers free, uh, not only from Freemasonry, but also from Islam and from Hinduism, uh, following his time in India. And also, to my great surprise, a few years ago, I found that one day, when I was teaching on healing in the Midlands, I don't remember where, he and Helen turned up along with doctors David and Heather Dukes, and that was the sign of Morris's loyalty and his love. 
his desire to share together in all that God had called us to do. And like all of us, I'm grieved to lose him as a friend. And I pray that Jesus will comfort, comfort us all. Anne asked me to bring a word, maybe a word about the kingdom. She said, the kingdom of God, which can never be shaken. And the Lord's prayer shows us that God's first desire and the thing that we're to pray for above all is that his kingdom comes on earth. And sometimes the way that God plans for the kingdom to come is strange and not at all what we would have expected. But that it is coming is certain and we just have to trust. Jesus, longing himself to see the kingdom of God on earth, prayed in Gethsemane that the cup of suffering on the cross would be taken from him. But he prayed, Father, not my will, but yours. It had to be the Father's way. Jesus also told his followers not to be anxious. The world's sufferings, he said, are like the necessary pains of a woman in childbirth. But through them, the kingdom of heaven will come. We don't understand why but we have the assurance of Jesus that it is so. And this is just as certain with the coronavirus. Satan, the destroyer of life, will have his part in it, just as he did through Judas in the death of Jesus. But in spite of the darkness of these times, God is at work through the solemn coronavirus days to bring his kingdom on earth. And his kingdom on earth is his ultimate goal. We and all believers share in it now, but Morris has entered its fullness, and he shares now with full glory with Jesus. Now, Psalm, 96, Psalm 46, which was read to us earlier, addresses our fears like this. God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. No matter what is rocking all around us, the psalm says. And these are the simple reasons that the psalm gives why we can be strong and not afraid. First of all, that the city where God is, the city where God is, is a life-giving river. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And we have that life-giving river now, in part, and Morris has it abundantly. God's life, his river, is as real and as fresh as ever. Second reason it gives for not being afraid, because God is in the middle of his city, and it is unshakable. Now, the kingdoms of the earth are tottering, as at this time there's economic meltdown. The whole world order of trade is being shaken. But God's kingdom remains, and we long to see it fully on the earth. He is in his city. And thirdly, he's not just there, but his help is real every day. God will help his city when the morning dawns. And that's true for us who remain on earth. We see only in part, but he helps us. And I believe this virus is a wake-up call from God. It shows us how vulnerable we are. If only the world would see that, cry out for his mercy and cry out for his help. And fourthly, with all his heavenly army, God is with us, a sure refuge in the battle. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of heavenly armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And that's said twice in the psalm. So God breaks the weapons of his enemies and commands his people to be still and understand that he is God and there is no other. And he is exalted in all the earth. And even when we and the world are so unfaithful, God is there waiting to be exalted. So for all of us, and especially at this time of great difficulty, the psalm tells us that our hope and our stability is to be found only in God himself, in his kingdom, in which we share now in the heavenly city, and which one day will unite completely with our lives on earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. We have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. God bless us all. We are going to have a time of prayer and thanksgiving for Morris. And I have asked David and Jill McKelvey to lead us. And they are great friends with Morris and Helen.
we are sure we can both speak, not only on our behalf, but for all those who are listening here today and for tomorrow. Morris was indeed a man of integrity and a very faithful friend to us all. We're sure we aren't the only ones whom he penciled into his diary so that we could meet up for a coffee or breakfast or a good old chat and fellowship. We shall greatly miss him, but not more so than Helen, his dear beloved wife. As we honour Morris now, let the unconditional love that you shared upon him through his life now fill the rest of this service today. Father God, we give you all the thanks, praise and celebrations of Morris's life. He has now come into your presence, to the throne room, and he has received his crown of glory from you. Even though we find it difficult to accept what has happened, we know that everything works out together for good. God, will you give us your peace that surpasses all our understanding? Give us your strength through the power of your Holy Spirit to pick up the baton and the legacy that has now been passed on to us all through Morris's gift of godly teaching, leadership and friendship that we all continue the race that is set before us now. We pray now for Helen, that Father God will continue to uphold her through this time, that she will feel and know the presence of your Holy Spirit, bringing her comfort, protection and provision, that she will feel the everlasting arms of God surrounding her with his love and peace. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray together that kingdom prayer. And so we are going to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to end our time of thanksgiving by singing this chorus. It's quite old. I do believe it was of one of Morris's favourites. Sometimes on a Tuesday afternoon when Morris was on the prayer team, he would lead the worship time that we had. And this often was a choice of his. And I only ever knew it as having one verse and a chorus, but Morris introduced us to two others. I phoned up recently uh, a new friend of mine, I hadn't really met him before, Roger Jones, who is a well-known uh, composer and musician. You've probably either taken part in one of his mus musicals or at least seen it. And so Roger is playing the piano and one of his colleagues, Helen, is leading us in this amazing song, which speaks so much, obviously about Jesus, but the ministry that Morris did here on earth. We sing together.
close by reading Paul's blessing from Romans 15 13 which we actually put on the back of our service sheet today. Now may God the inspiration and fountain of hope fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace as you trust in him. So at the end of this service we say follow Jesus's teaching and pick up the baton and run. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in these challenging times, remain with you today and always. Amen.